Hello, I'm Luxbrush. And I'm Ember. And this is our thoughts on My Little Pony, French Biz Magic. Season 4, Episode 23, Inspiration Manifestation. I'm going to start things off a little bit differently this time and actually talk about the moral right off the bat. Mainly because by the end of the episode, I was like, this does not jive with the rest of the episode. It just doesn't work for me based on the rest of the episode. You could have done something completely different and it would have worked a whole lot better because it felt like the episode was more about addiction and something like that would be very addictive to a creative personality. I mean, the power to create whatever's in your mind in the world. Do you know how many people who are creative people would kill for that? Including us, we've discussed previously just on our own that we would love to be able to, okay, the image that's in my brain if we could get that exact image on a piece of paper, I would love to draw. But since I can't make it look as good as I can think it, I don't want to draw. And even with me, who does have a bit of talent in drawing, I still shout at my hand going, Why aren't you doing what I'm telling you to do? <laughs> this is the image I have in my head. Put that on paper. How hard is that, hand? How hard is that? And it was about Spike learning to tell your friend when they're doing something wrong, even if it may hurt their feelings. Huh? When it's not even really Rarity's fault? When it's Spike's fault for finding the book and having her cast the spell without knowing what the spell was? And this was a very poor solution to Rarity's problem. Why was Spike's thought to go to the castle of the two sisters and look through the library for a book of magic to help Rarity? If you need to make something quickly, more hands lighten the load. Rarity has five close friends. Let's call those five friends and build a puppet theater together. And two of them have talents that would help build the thing in like seconds. Well, three if you count Pinky. Twilight is the major one. She's like the queen of all magic, really. Or princess in this case. And then you have Applejack, who could have asked Apple Bloom to build a cart. And it would have been like done, you know, real quick. <sighs> But on to my next point of the episode. It's nice to see Rarity's mom again. She was in the background with Sweetie Belle mm -hmm. during the pan where Pinkie Pie was all hopping around going, Foles Day has almost started! Or Foles, whatever they called it, but it was basically a day for Foles. Full and Philly, which does not even make sense. I mean, it's nice alliteration, Full and Philly Festival. It has a nice alliteration, but if I recall correctly, Colt is male. Philly is female. Foal is gender neutral. Also, isn't Spike like the only dragon Rarity really knows? Yes. You know, the whole, you are my favorite dragon. I'm like, he's like the only dragon you really know, Rarity. Yeah, he's the only dragon you're on good terms with. Because let's see, the only other dragons you've encountered is the red one in Dragon Shy. The ones that you sort of interacted with when you guys were all following Spike on his solo journey and were disguised as Crackle, or Crackle's cousin, whatever it was. But most dragons aren't nice. So even if you knew more dragons, odds are Spike still be your favorite dragon. And it doesn't sound like that guy, when he apparently commissioned the wagon from Rarity, told her anything about what he wanted at all for how off apparently she was. I mean, he if you're going to commission something from someone, you tell them pretty much what you want. I want a wagon that's portable. It has to be wide enough for me to be able to use my puppets in. And I have to be able to pull it once I'm done. Apparently, none of that was told to Rarity. <laughs> yeah, and I still don't understand how this is her contribution. I mean, couldn't she, like, be setting up her own stand and giving fashion makeovers or... You know, or face paints, or I'm sure she knows how to give a hoof a cure. And speaking of puppets, I liked the little touches about all the little animations they did with the puppets. And it makes sense that a unicorn would be a puppet master. Well, you have that whole thing of not needing strings, and you can be a lot more accurate and creative with the movements. Oh, and the drama couch is back. Yes. <laughs> Along with tubs upon tubs of vanilla oat swirl. I would not have figured Rarity for vanilla. The ice cream of choice when you are depressed is always chocolate. Should have been chocolate oat swirl, I'm sorry. <laughs> I also like how when 
Spike was trying to soothe Rarity. He actually took a moment to count how many times he said Puppet Theater. Mm -hmm. And he was like, okay, oh yeah, that, that apparently is enough. And I still like the animation touch of how they still show Rarity when she's crying, her mascara's running. I wanted to say that. <laughs> <laughs> but you would think a pony as stylish as Rarity would use waterproof mascara. Or use her magic to make it so her mascara doesn't run. Well, we don't know the limits of her unicorn magic. Mm, well, it could also be magically enhanced mascara. Yeah. And we get a nice callback to the Two Sisters castle with Spike going there to find the book he didn't really need to find. Also, oh look, plot device! I mean a book! Yes, and let's have Spike fetch it without realizing how much danger he's in. Those oblivious old-school cartoon characters. And I think this is only the second time we've ever seen Spike use his fire outside of sending letters. I'm trying to think of the other time. It was probably the dragon episode, huh? The only other times I can think of is during the Dragon Quest one, where he did a little bit of fire there, and when Applejack used him as a fire starter. And considering the level of damage we've seen Spike's fire do, it seems a little intense that he was able to melt the lock. I think the most damage outside of some books, which are highly flammable, that he managed was in the time travel episode when Twilight took that hit and her mane got all singed. And two things came to mind during the scene where Spike was getting the book. Why do they even have that book? And the other was, he was like that damn crow from the Water Brothers cartoons. You know, the one who would walk around, take three steps and hop, and no one could catch him? Because Spike was totally oblivious to how everything was crumbling around him, and all of which was like, oh, no, 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 no. He's okay. That was so weird. <laughs> I know, but the answer to why the book was in the castle would be that as the princesses, you know, protectors of the kingdom and wielders of powerful magic, the two sisters came across someone using that book, managed to save them from the dark magic, and then took the book and locked it away to keep it safe. The why you would use a whole room for a single book when all you need is a small safe with some magic protections on it. And moving back to Ponyville, I like the new Missy Main style for Rarity. It had some really nice touches to it, like it showed the hair more clumping together than Frizzy. Like she's been really crying and it's gotten wet from her crying. Mm hmm And that was a whole lot of ice cream. <laughs> I know you said before, but there was like, what, 20 tubs there? Definitely a lot. I am, other than the flavor, I'm surprised she had that many tubs of ice cream in her freezer. Because you know she didn't go out and buy them. Because she's miserable. She wouldn't want to interact with other people. That's why she ran off to go hide in a room and collapse on the drama couch. And at this point, once we started getting into what the book's effects actually were, I thought we may end up with more of a Midas tale. You know, the golden touch. Yeah, I thought she would end up changing something that she would regret severely, like actually making a change to one of her friends. Like how in Magical Mystery Cure, Twilight cast that spell and ended up changing the destinies of her friends because she switched their cutie marks and interfered with them becoming what they were meant to be. Yeah, and this is where the um, moral started getting... Well, the moral didn't get confused for me until the end, but I'll get back to that more later. <laughs> And I kind of recognize the voice that the puppeteer is trying to imitate, or at least the voice actor of the puppeteer is trying to imitate, but I can't place where. It's like a very common voice to imitate, especially in the older cartoons. Yeah, well, it's basically every sleazy snake oil salesman ever. <laughs> Though I think it would have been nice if, just for fun, he had sounded more like the evil puppet master from Pinocchio. Because to me, he sounded sneaky and slimy. It's like... I don't think I'd trust this guy to put on a puppet show. <laughs> uh, and going back to the power that she actually got, I definitely think they could have gone in a different direction. Like, this could have definitely been a story about addiction and being addicted to something, rather than what we actually ended up being, because it just disappointed me or it fell out of place with the moral we actually got. 
Yeah, for me the moral was a very jarring note because that wasn't the moral I was getting from the episode. I was getting an addiction moral. Or don't force your point of view on others. Because it could go for both. Because the changes that Rarity was making to the town were not pleasing anyone. None of the changes she made made the other ponies happy. But she only started going out into Ponyville after she got the addicting taste of the power because she stayed up all night creating all of the clothing that would have normally taken her weeks and weeks. More like months and months. <laughs> yes, considering she did her fall line for the next 15 seasons. Which if you think about it, it's really hard to do since you would have to predict the future. <laughs> yes, but I think that part of the power of the spell makes you think more that what you think is right, more than just being your point of view, your opinion, your taste, your style. And moving on to the first thing Rarity changes, the cart. And I like how Granny Smith was like, are my eyes playing tricks on me again? And I thought, again? Apparently Granny Smith hallucinates a lot. Yeah, but it's also a standard trope of, you know, oh, are my old eyes playing tricks on me? And the voice acting work from Rarity and how she adds a bit of twinge of crazy to her voice throughout the rest of the episode after she really gets into the spell of the book. A really nice touch. I really like Tabitha in this episode. <laughs> yeah, and the way you could see the spell taking hold of her by the changes in her eyes. But you saw at the beginning when the magic wound itself around her horn that this had become part of her, that the spell was now integral to her magic. In making a giant house for one bird and the bird getting lost, that was like, I laughed at that moment when Flourish was like, no, 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 try that door. Wait, that's a closet. I'm sorry. Um, try the stairs. No, the other stairs. I know. It falls into that whole, this is beautiful, therefore this is better. Even though it's completely impractical. It's like the dress she made for Rainbow Dash. It's very beautiful, but it's very impractical for cloud kicking. Especially since it covered her back legs. All of these misdirected changes that she made in the town. Specifically, the cart reminded me of an old um, She-Ra storybook I had when I was a kid where Glimmer, Angelica's daughter, gets a crown that gives her the power to make changes to the real world. And she flies around on her magical swan helping people. But because she doesn't understand the situation, the changes she makes don't help the people. They actually are the opposite of helping, or in some cases, actually put them in danger. And you know how I was talking about Tabitha's voice acting before? She seemed to be doing kind of a beatbox-like sound recently when she makes a frustrated now. It's like, pfft, I can't duplicate it, but it's an episode where Spike says, um, isn't this like this? She goes, pfft. No, Spike, and she makes this kind of weird beatbot version of that noise. <laughs> this is like the third time she's done it in my recent memory. You might want to go and compare that to the episode in The Great of Powerful Trixie, where she makes a derisive noise when they're in Trixie's audience. That would probably show a good progression between what you're hearing and noticing now and what she was doing earlier. Speaking of the animation effect on Rarity that we were talking about earlier, I really like the way they did it, how it affects her eyes and her, and her magic color. And apparently this is dark magic again, though it mostly reminded me of the changelings. Though you could say that was dark magic as well. Yeah, it did look more like the changeling magic than uh, the magic that Sombra used. And moving on to the kids' party, that look on the clown's face once he was transformed into a fancy waiter was like, oh god, my worst nightmare. I know. But it was nice to see both Vinyl and Octavia as background ponies in the same episode. You saw Vinyl? I only saw Octavia. And it's nice to have her back. I mean, that was a nice band. <laughs> it was nice to see the mariachi band back. And the change from the mariachi band to Octavia's band was a more profound change than changing the clown to a waiter. Because there she altered the appearance of a single pony. Where with the mariachi band, she actually did a replacement. Replacing the mariachi band with the classical music trio. And Vinyl was in the very beginning when Pinkie Pie was walking down the lane. 
She was at one of the booths. I guess I need to watch it again. <laughs> I was just so distracted by Pinkie Pie. You know, she was right there dancing around. I know, but it's kind of funny because you're usually better than I am at noticing background ponies. I think it's also because that part of the episode, I was a little distracted getting ready for work watching it. And I love how even Pinkie Pie is shocked by the changes to the party when she arrives. I mean, that must take some work. We're talking about Pinkie Pie here. Yeah, but she's showing up and she knows it's a party, but no one is smiling. There's something very wrong here. And was it just me? Or did you also think that that Spike may be stuck in that outfit? Because I was thinking some of the changes were more permanent than they actually were in the episode. Like, Spike wouldn't be able to get out of that outfit later because he was magically sealed in it. And the fact that some ponies were stuck inside the gazebo led further to that fact that I thought he may be stuck in that outfit. Mm. I didn't think that he would be stuck in the outfit beyond that he was incapable of getting out of the outfit on his own because it was so heavy and restrictive. And wasn't the looks Aloysius was giving to Spike throughout the episode priceless? Yeah. I think there were several times where he rolled his eyes like, Oh my god, Spike. I can't even speak and I know better than you. <laughs> Aloysius has already been proven to be very intelligent. You know, at his introductory episode, he's working as Twilight's assistant, which is the same job that Spike does. So reasonably, you must think they are at a similar intelligence level, at least insofar as their ability to assist Twilight in her studies and research, which once again blurs the lines a little bit, you know, pet versus partner. It's kind of nice that we actually showed Twilight performing her prince's duties again. I mean, really get to see that. She's actually doing her prince's stuff, and the mayor is actually going, Princess Twilight! Yeah, especially not in Ponyville. Oh look, another background pony. Most people refer to her as Blossom Forth. It's the white pegasus with green and red hair. Hmm. Well, per usual, I didn't notice her. <laughs> yeah, it was during the scene where everyone's like, Oh my god, the ground's so bright, it's blinding! It was the pegasus right in front. Ah. Well, I think with that shading, I wouldn't have been able to accurately pick out the main colors. That, that image was a little difficult to look at because it was very bright. And at this point in the story, you have to ask whether it was Rarity's creativity or an entity inside of the spell that was driving everything. Because when Rarity is freed from the spell and she looks at Ponyville, she thinks that something terrible has happened. And Rarity rarely is upset with her design choices. I mean, she makes changes and goes, oh no, this is better, oh I'm going to start over, but she does. She never absolutely hates something she made, with the exception of the five dresses she made to her friend's exact specifications that weren't really her design at all. And by this point, it's also clear that she seems to want to like take over the world and change it, quote unquote, for the better. Yeah, she was on her way to being a misguided villainess. Why would they need that many chariots to travel to all the different locations? We don't need a chariot for each location. And I read that some people question how Spike could have so easily destroyed the book by eating it. But I myself think by this point, the book had no power in it. It was all the power was in rarity by this point, And the spell did, or the entity of the spell, didn't need the container of the book anymore. That's why you see the green leave rarity when the spell is finally countered by Spike speaking the truth to Rarity? Well, I didn't understand why she would need the book after casting the spell at all, because the spell has already been cast. So whether or not there's still any magic in the book or the book contains any other spells, the spell you cast is active. You don't need to take the book around with you, and close proximity of the book shouldn't affect the magic. So to me, it wasn't logical that she wanted to cling to the book, Number one. And number two, that taking the book away would stop her. I mean, it was a nice idea of a way that Spike could stop her without having to have an uncomfortable confrontation. It was very nice of Aloysius to help. And I really like how small Spike sounds when he's like, I'm so scared right now. <laughs> mm -hmm. I would be too. <laughs> yeah. My friend's turning into a maniacal evil genius with an evil plan to take over the world. And it's my fault. I'm so doomed. Because <laughs> the other way I thought this would go is that the power would actually get out of her control. That every single thing she thought about would become manifest. 
How like in Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends, Goo would get overstimulated and create dozens of friends accidentally. Yeah, kind of like how I referred back to the Midas tale. Mm -hmm. Except in this case, instead of everything you touch turns to gold, everything you think about becomes real. And considering how many random thoughts go through my head in a couple of seconds, that would be dangerous. Yeah, th this is a power I would want, but I would want it under very strict control. And probably not to be able to manifest things in the real world but just artistically. And it's good to know that both Princess Cadence and Luna showed up to help clean things up after this whole mess. It's a very long trip for both of them. I mean, they'd have to come from Canterlot and the Crystal Empire. And I like how she specifically says dark magic and clarifies for us that it was dark magic that Rarity and Spike were messing with. Mm -hmm. And I like how they showed how exhausted Twilight was. Yeah, and Spike was being a bit of an ass. Even though he just learned that lesson, there's something called tact, Spike. I think you need to learn that next. Yeah, because a nicer way to say that would be, oh, you must be really worn out. Um, I get you some water or some oats or something? Or give you a back massage? I thought it was a good episode, but the moral felt like it was a mismatch for the episode to me. The moral should in my opinion, have been about addiction and how you can let even small things that start out non-addictive get out of control. Or it could have been about how your opinion is just your opinion. It's not what everyone else should follow. Yeah, that's what I was expecting the lesson to be. So it was very jarring at the end for Spike to be writing in the journal about honesty. Okay, yes, Spike telling the truth and the element of honesty was the way to end the spell, but that wasn't what most of the episode was. And to me it could have also been about the whole Midas touch story of, you may have wished for this and it may have been the perfect thing for any creative, but it doesn't mean that it's something you should have in the way it was presented here. If I made any sense there. <laughs> In terms of be careful what you wish for, the thing that you desire most is not always going to be good in reality. Mm, thank you for clarifying that. You're welcome. Thanks for listening. If you've enjoyed this, please consider subscribing and or leaving a friendly, and I do mean friendly, comment below. If you'd like to see high-res versions of Lux's artwork, you can check him out over on DeviantArt. If you'd like to follow the progress of these episodes, and maybe find some other snippets on other topics, you can check us out over on Tumblr. Links in the description. This has been our thoughts on My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic, Season 4, Episode 23, Inspiration, Manifestation. And here's an outtake from this episode. Don't go there. Fanfics live there. Duh! Edit that out, edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> I almost want to leave it in now. <laughs> Don't you dare. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna stop laughing. I am dripping sweat. That's what you get. Please continue with any other follow up ideas so I can get out of this damn odd car. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I think we're done. I think um, we're done? Yeah. Recording off. Okay. You can get out of the car.